Roger Dean Craig, former Dallas County Deputy Sheriff, winner of the Man of the Year Award in 1960 for law enforcement in recognition of outstanding performance in the line of duty. Where were you on the day of the assassination of John Kennedy? I was standing out in front of the uh, sheriff's office, which at that time was at 505 Main Street. They've moved it since then, but uh, it was at 505 Main Street, directly in front of the front door. Uh, was the motorcade passing that area at that time? No, we had to wait about 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived, but uh, the sheriff had sent us out there that early to wait. Uh, were you merely spectator or were you on duty? Uh, well, no, I was on duty, but uh, a couple hours before Kennedy was to arrive, uh, the sheriff called us in, what I call the street people, the plainclothesmen, the detectives, and uh, he instructed us that we were to stand out in front and in no way take part in the security of that motorcade that we were merely spectators and nothing more. Did that seem unusual to you? It did to me at the time because uh, there were so many people around and so few Dallas police officers. This is one of the first things I noticed was the lack of Dallas police officers Try to keep the people back. Uh, the president came by and they made the right turn on to Houston Street. And oh, I'll say, you know, a few seconds later, give him time to get to Elm Street and make the left, I heard what was a, what I call it a report, a gunshot. And I said, oh, I said, oh my God. And I turned and started toward Houston Street, running just as hard as I could. And I was probably 15 steps from Houston Street. And before I reached those 15 steps, I heard two more reports. Then you arrived at Elm Street. Right. Okay, what did you see? Well, there was a Dallas police officer running up the grassy knoll to the picket fence. So I immediately assumed the motorcade had, had left by then. And I immediately assumed that he knew something about the shots or he wouldn't have been headed for the picket fence. So I followed him. Were you aware the president had been hit? Not at that time. Now, uh, people were mentioning the president was shot, and someone else said a Secret Service agent was shot, and there were just stories flying all over. But my interest was to get behind that picket fence because that's where that Dallas police officer was headed. I worked in that area for, oh, probably, oh, seven, eight minutes, maybe, something like that, mm -hmm. until I ran on to... Uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Arnold Rowland. Now, Mr. Rowland told me that 15 minutes before the motorcade arrived, he saw two men on the sixth floor of the school book depository. Now, one was a white male in the east corner of the sixth floor with a rifle. The other one was a colored male at the west end of the sixth floor floor pacing back and forth and I went uh, to the <clears throat> south side of Elm Street to look for any uh, signs of any bullet striking the curb or the street or anything uh, by this time it had been established that the president had been shot and uh, Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters joined me at that time Everybody was coming to the scene of the shooting, you know, which is normal. You know, people are just that way. But as I was searching the south curb of Elm Street, I heard a shrill whistle. And I looked up. It just drew my attention. It was coming from across the street. And there was a light green Rambler station wagon driving real slow west on Elm Street and the driver was leaning over to his right looking up at a man running down the grass so I immediately tried to cross the street to take these two people into custody for questioning just 
you know, everybody else was coming to the scene. These were the only two people leaving. And this was suspicious in my mind, you know, at the time. So I wanted to talk to them. But I couldn't get across the street because a city officer who was stationed at Houston and Elm had left his post and the traffic, you know, was so heavy I just couldn't get across the street to him. But I did get a good look at the man coming down the grassy knoll. And he got in the station wagon and they drove west on Elm Street. It had been determined that the uh, shots came from the southeast window how I don't know the Dallas police were saying this so we immediately went there and uh, Deputy Sheriff Luke Mooney was with me when we found the shells we found three hulls beside the window on the sixth floor and uh, they were laying three in a row not more than this an inch was breast the three spent yes, cartridges three spent cartridges they were li lying three in a row not more than an inch apart all pointing in the same direction of course, I didn't touch them. They hadn't been photographed or fingerprinted or anything. I didn't touch those. And uh, there was a lunch sack, very small, brown paper lunch sack up there. Had some chicken bones in it. And uh, there was a soda bottle sitting on a box. And we began then to uh, search for a weapon. And we started toward, uh, everybody took a different direction. And uh, Deputy Sheriff Boone and myself just happened to head for the northwest corner of the building. <clears throat> and uh, Boone was ahead of me by about eight feet. And there was a, there were a stack of boxes uh, just at the head of the stairwell going downstairs. And Boone looked over into it and said, here it is. Here's the rifle. So I immediately went over beside him and looked over, and there was a rifle. But we didn't touch it until Captain Fritz and Lieutenant Day from the ID department of the Dallas Police Department got there. Now, Captain Fritz was chief of homicide, and Lieutenant Day was from the Identification Bureau. They got there and uh, took some pictures of the rifle, and then uh, I believe Dave pulled the rifle out and handed it to Captain Fritz, who held it up by the, uh, had a strap on it. He held it up by the strap and asked if anyone knew what kind of rifle it was. Well, by this time, Deputy Constable Seymour Weitzman had joined us. And uh, Weitzman was a uh, gun buff. He had a sporting goods store at one time. He was very good at, with weapons. And he said, it looks like a Mauser. And he walked over to Fritz. And Captain Fritz was holding the rifle up in the air. And I was standing next to Weitzman. He was standing next to Fritz. And we weren't any more than six or eight inches from the rifle and stamped right on the barrel of the rifle was 7.65 Mauser. And that's when Watchman said it is a Mauser and pointed to the 7.65 Mauser stamp on the barrel. There's an intonation to that statement that it should mean something. Well, the shells we found came from a six... 0.5 Italian rifle. You mean those three the cartridges? The two don't relate. Three cartridges that were found at the southeast the corner. In the southeast corner. Came from a 6.5 Italian carbine. That afternoon, after Officer Tippett was killed, they took a suspect into custody. And uh, I, got, I was thinking about this man getting away from me. The man that got into the Green Rambler. The Green Rambler. And I called Captain Fritz at his office and gave him a description of the man I saw get into the Rambler. And uh, he told me, and I quote him, it sounds like the suspect we have in custody.
come on up and take a look at him. So I went out and got in my unmarked car and drove to the uh, city hall, went directly to Captain Fritz's office. And uh, we went into Captain Fritz's inner office and uh, the man was sitting in a chair behind a desk. And there was another gentleman, I assumed he was one of Fritz's people because he had the white cowboy hat on, which was the trademark at that time of the Dallas Homicide Bureau. And Fritz turned to me and said, is this the man you saw? And I said, yes. And it was. It was. So he turned to the suspect and he said, this man saw you leave. At which time the suspect became a little excited. And he said, I told you people I did. And Fritz said, now take it easy, son, talking to the suspect. He said, we're just trying to find out what happened here. He said, what about the car? I didn't say station wagon. He said, what about the car? at which time the suspect leaned forward and put both hands up on the desk and said, that station wagon belongs to Mrs. Payne. Don't try to drag her into this. Then he leaned back and very disgustedly said, everybody will know who I am now. Now this was not a brag. I know it's been blown up to be a brag in the Warren Commission. But this was not a brag. This was a man that, that uh, it was, he was uh, embarrassed about it. Or disgusted that he had, had uh, uh, blown his cover or, or, or been caught or, or something. You know, it, uh, it wasn't a brag. My name appeared in several books that had come out condemning the Warren Commission. Or, so people began to come from all over the country and they'd come in and ask me if they could talk to me and ask me what happened on that day and I saw nothing wrong with telling them what I saw and heard, you know. I gave my statement. So, uh, the sheriff called me in and asked me what the people wanted that were coming down there and I told him they just wanted to talk to me about what happened and he said, well, you tell them when they come that you didn't see anything and you didn't hear anything. Did the interviews keep on after you were fired or were you continue to be? No, I tried to uh, get back to a normal way of life. You know, I had a family to support and uh, I took a job managing a bail bond company. But uh, <clears throat> people weren't coming around so much asking me questions as they were following me. And uh, people I've known for a long time, one in particular, asked me to meet him at a coffee shop at uh, Columbia and uh, Carroll Street. And so he was about an hour late, and I was sitting in my car waiting outside of his place. And these two cars kept circling the block. So we took. Uh, Finally he arrived and we went over and we had our coffee. We were followed in by this man in a checkered jacket that was driving one of the cars. So by the time we finished our coffee, we started to leave. The man jumped up and he left first. And we walked out and uh, went over to Columbia Street. We were standing on the curb and all of a sudden my friend fell to the ground. And I thought, well, he stumbled, you know. And for some reason, I stepped off of the curb. And when I did, a shot came from behind and uh, passed over my left ear. And uh, I headed for my car immediately and uh, went home. And, uh, Your friend dropped, in other words, to be out of the line of fire. Before the shot was fired. He yeah. apparently he knew what was going to happen. That's my conclusion now. I was digging up some information, actually for uh, Jim Garrison and, and, and Penn Jones, Jr. of Midlothian. I was digging up some information that they wanted 
you know, in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And I parked my car on the side of the street, and I went to get this information. And when I came back and cranked up my car, it blew up. The engine caught fire, the hood came up, the firewall blew out. Uh, I had uh, uh, all the fuses blew, and uh, I was burnt in the chest area, and I had pieces of glass and metal in the chest small pieces. I don't know what they put in it, but... Uh, it's not possible the car itself could have malfunctioned or done it? Not that much of an explosion, no. Uh -uh. Somebody put a bomb in your car? Somebody put something in it. This last time we had a case to work in West Texas in the Davis Mountains. And my boss sent me out there. And... Uh, he called the client who was on a three-party line and told him what flight I was coming in the middle on, where I was going to rent my car, where I would meet him, and at what time. So I flew in the middle and I rented the car, and I arrived, I was about two miles from where I was supposed to meet the client, a mile or two miles from where I was supposed to meet him. I was supposed to meet him at 3 o'clock, and it was 2.55 then. I rounded a curve, and there were two men standing outside of a car that was parked crossways in the road. And there wasn't anything to do but try to go around them, and I tried, and I missed, and I went over the edge of the mountain, and I rolled end over end for 90 feet or so. I broke my back in two places. I broke my left shoulder. I tore the ulnar nerve and ligaments out of my left elbow crushed my left foot, my right leg. I spent a year in a hospital, four major surgeries, two on my back, and I'm now totally disabled in the back, partially disabled in the right leg, and uh, unemployed again. Do you think anyone else is going to come forward and uh, tell it like it was? Or as they saw it? I don't know. I, yeah, I can't speak for anyone else. Do you think it'll help your situation if someone else does? Or do you think they too would be harassed and put down? I don't, if they knew something really important, uh, one of us would have to go. You can't have yeah. cooperating witnesses. It's, uh, um, there are people who know something very important. I'm sure they are now. Buddy Walters was one of them that knew something very important, but he was shot to death here a couple of years ago. Now I have two friends that were on the bond desk. Uh, one of them was still talking to me. And uh, he died of cancer. And then uh, the other one, he died here I believe last December of a kidney infection. And then uh, there was another one that was still talking to me. And uh, they, these were all people with the sheriff's office now. And uh, he died. And uh, I'm not really sure what he died of. I called the, the sheriff and, and offered my condolences, you know, and, and, and all the sheriff had to say was he had more chain than he could carry the man that died. Tell me what Roger Craig feels inside right now. What's he see for tomorrow? What do I see for tomorrow? What do you feel inside right now, and what do you see for tomorrow? I, when I get up, let me put it this way. When I get up in the morning, I say, this is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. Roger Craig died in Dallas, May 15, 1975, of a rifle wound in the chest. He owned two pistols. The coroner's verdict? Suicide.